Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. I thank you once again for joining us in our series of conversations on being church in the time of COVID-19. Today, I am very privileged to have joining me, my friend, Dr. Eddie Glau, Chair of and James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor in the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University. He is also a frequent commentator on MSNBC, the author of many groundbreaking books that speak to the searing truth of race and politics in America and the legacy of the literary genius and social prophet, James Baldwin. And indeed, I can't commend to you enough his forthcoming book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. Welcome, Eddie, and thank you for taking this time today to join me in conversation. It is such a pleasure to be with you, Dean. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> Great, well, I already know Dr. Glaub, that we don't have enough time to cover what needs to be covered. So mm. let's jump right in. And in the words of James Baldwin, let's try to get at what is really happening here as we face this pandemic crisis. So let me begin with an observation you make from your book, Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul. You say in that book that our democratic principles do not exist in a space apart from our commitment to white supremacy. In this regard, what COVID-19 is laying bare is the reality that the injustice that is the in inequity of white supremacy is not, as you say, an aberration to our democracy, but rather is a reflection of the very democratic project we have built in this country. So first, let me ask you, with this being the case, what do you make of, say, the surprise that many people express as they recognize through COVID the injustice and inequalities in this country that are a reflection of white supremacy? Well, Dean Douglas, thank you so much. Um, you know, it's, it's so consistent and it reminds me of something that, that Jimmy Baldwin wrote in The Fire Next Time in 1963, where he said that, you know, millions are languishing in the shadows. I'm paraphrasing him, paraphrasing him here. Um, and people don't know it or don't wanna know it, right? And he says that the innocence is the crime. Yeah. Right, the innocence is the crime. So there's this willful ignorance about what happens in this country. And when it bubbles up, when Katrina washes it on shore, when uh, COVID reveals all of the fissures and breakages, people clutch their pearls and said, oh my God, is this America? When in fact, those who've had to bear the brunt of it and live right. the burden of it knew it all along. And so what COVID-19 has revealed um, is in some ways, all of those fissures, those breakages, in fact, it hasn't revealed, it has lived in them. It has thrived and metastasized in those breakages. And so the most vulnerable among us, particularly black and brown folk, uh, poor folk, uh, elderly folk, the most vulnerable among us have in some ways had, had to bear the burden of, of, of this virus. And it has everything to do, going back to democracy and black, white supremacy and okay. structures and the like, but at the heart of white supremacy, is this idea of valuing, evaluation. In this country, it is a country organized on the belief that some people are valued more than others. And that some people happen to be white, rich men. Uh, and, that they're, and, and that is evidenced in the very ways in which the society is organized. Yeah, and, and in many ways, just the surprise itself, or as you said, that innocence, is a reflection of the ideology of whiteness itself. It is, mm -hmm. it is a white privilege to not have to recognize the way in which, in fact, democracy has not functioned in this country. And 
<laughs> the way in which it has not valued certain persons. And yeah. so let's let's go to that for a moment. When we talk about quote unquote essential workers who have not been considered essential human beings. Mm. And I think about that in relationship to our food supply chain and the meat and poultry plants that of course on April 28th, uh, President Trump put, put forth an executive order to open those plants up and to keep those plants open in spite of the fact that so many workers were uh, contracting COVID and, and dying from COVID. And what I kept thinking, Eddie, was that we've been here before. This mm -hmm. reminded me of the cotton fields. And when the product from the field that was more important than the lives, those who were producing the product, and it was eerily reminiscent when he put forth in his executive order that he would pay uh, companies for the loss. Uh, it was eerily reminiscent of the way in which after the Civil War, slave owners were going to be paid for the loss of their labor, as opposed to any attention or care for the human beings that were right. enslaved. So what are your thoughts? Uh, that's a great, that's a great point. And you know, what's consistent across those two historical examples yeah. is the ugliness of capitalism. Yes, indeed. And yep. what capitalism in America has always presupposed is disposable people. Mm -hmm. Folks whose sole purpose is instrumental in the production of surplus value. Nobody was talking about meat meatpacking workers as essential when ICE was raiding meatpacking uh, industries in Mississippi. Exactly. That's exactly nope. right. No one was taught, they weren't talking about them as essential to our food supply when they were part of this nativist mean-spirited immigration policy that led to the actions that we saw in the South and across the country. So, so no one's talking about the fact that these people who are working in close proximity to one another, risking their lives, only making on average $24,000 a year, right? So part of what we're seeing is the cruel nature of late capitalism, right? It begins with the assumption that some people That's are right. disposable in the service of the 1% and the top one-tenth of a percent who extract profit, who extract resources for their own gain. Most of these folk out here, as Zerlina Maxwell, my colleague at MSNBC said, most of these folk out here clamoring for the economy to open only want to be served. That's right. So so so, so let's that's exactly right. So let's let's follow up with that. Mm -hmm. This clamor for the economy to be open and, and you rightly bring together this the capitalistic greed with even you know these who are considered essential uh to keep that going yet non-essential human beings and so i think of the fact while there is this clamor and this urgency in this rush to open up the economy to open up states in spite of the fact <laughs> that people of color are still being decimated right. by this virus. It is as if we have said that these people who have always been considered really non-essential human beings, the expendable have now become disposable. Exactly. So not only are we talking about black and brown folk, we're talking about folks locked in prisons, and folk they, languishing in nursing homes, right? These folk are all disposable, right? In, in, because whatever we need to do, we need to get the economy working, right? Let's be very, very clear here. None of this had to happen. That's, that's right. So when we look at how Europe has responded, how Germany in particular has responded, we don't, Germany doesn't have massive unemployment. They're not claiming 36 million people out of jobs. We know that because we've tethered health cover, healthcare coverage to employment, right? The fact that 36 million people are out of jobs, now they are health insecure. Okay. And then you say to yourself, okay, healthcare crisis, lost your job, no resources. So we see thousands of people lining up in food banks when the country could have easily engaged in a universal basic income. That's right. Could have easily engage, chose to provide healthcare for all of its citizens. In other words, what we're seeing in the name of greed 
and in the name of a kind of white supremacist logic that overdetermines capitalism in this country is a choice to, to embrace massive unemployment, massive hunger, and massive disease, right? And so we have to keep saying this, Dean, that these people are choosing this. That's right, that's right. It didn't have to, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, right? no, it doesn't have to be. That's precisely right. And so in so many ways, making a choice of the, the way our country will be. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna get back uh, uh, to that in a moment, but the point you make is so salient because we talk about the readiness for a pandemic of this nature. And we often talk about that in terms of whether or not our health infrastructure, medical infrastructure was ready, our political infrastructure was ready, our economic infrastructure was ready. But what we don't talk about is sort of our social infrastructure, our cultural infrastructure. And as long as there is this kind of inequity, inequality and injustice, when it comes to who has access to the simple things that allow people to live, then this Amen. country will never be ready for a pandemic of this nature because all it does is exacerbates the problems that were already there. Amen, that's, that's absolutely right. That's, abs that's all I need to do is say ditto. <laughs> so then let's, get, let's, let's say a little bit more about these protests then these protests going on to try to open the states that the president has encouraged uh, and that he has suggested that the people are fighting uh, for their liberty. And what we see in these protests is he says to liberate uh, the states are men showing up and not all men, but showing up with guns strapped across their chest uh, some waving Confederate flags and other symbols of white supremacist hate going on to state capital lawns and the president pronounces them very good people, yet it was not too long ago that Colin Kaepernick and others were berated and castigated for not a gun, but taking a knee uh, in protests of injustice and inequality, not to speak of the fact that if black men were to emerge onto the state capitol hacking guns, <laughs> can we imagine what would happen? We don't have to imagine it. We have uh, Auburn, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey, who was seen as threatening as he jogs down the street yeah. unarmed. And so what's happening here? How well, do we it, respond? Know, well, I mean, we, we have to tell the truth and shame the devil, you know, in some ways, right? And that is to say that it's always been the case in this country that our patriotism has to be uh, evidenced in, um, how can I put this, in our appreciation, right? We can't be uh, critical patriots, right? We can't be critical of the country because we are always recipients of its phil philanthropic charity. And so, what are who are you to be criticizing? If it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be able to play football. If it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be able to dribble that basketball. So the expectation is for us to be grateful and not to be critical, right? So there's selective patriotism going on. But you know what's interesting is that for 40 years we have been, in some ways, drowning in a political ideology that has produced this. Yeah, and it's you know it's we talk about it from the age of Reagan, but we can actually go back to Jimmy Carter. But we've seen, in some ways, a systematic attack on the social safety net and a discourse around freedom and liberty that is rooted in choice. And the notion of choice is actually bound up with taking us or understanding the American citizen, not as a moral and ethical human being, right. but really a self-interested agent engaged in ra the rational pursuit of their own aims and ends. So we have a society that's built on competition and rivalry Right, and the idea of choice is the freedom to choose what I want, <laughs> even if it means to hurt you and to harm you, right? So it's not just simply having 800 channels on your television, right? It's the choice to, to live in segregated neighborhoods. It's the choice of being able to, you know, to, to, to send, your, send your child 
to an all white school and, and the like, right? So this idea of choice at the heart of opening the society tethered to Confederate flags, tethered to Nazi symbols, tethered to uh, first, second, so-called second amendment rights is all bound up being in this deep white resentment that they're losing control over the country. And that, the virus is just another instance in which this is being expressed. That's no. And again, all I can say, as you would say, is ditto and amen to that, because it is very clear that only certain people have the right to make a choice, right? Exactly. And that's a, that's a white privilege in, in, in this country. And so what I see in these protests to open up and people rushing bars and all of this kind of thing and confronting uh, uh, state governments is really an extension of the stand your ground culture. It is whiteness standing its ground claiming their right to movement, their right to space, their right to participate in an unfettered capitalistic consumerist economy. And so, and they only have the choice uh, to do that and they negate the choice is of other people. This, the choice is the choice to survive. You know, the, the non-essential human beings of color can't even make the choice to survive because your choice to, to stand your ground negates my choice of life. And our country has made, is seeming to make that decision over and over, over and over. over again. So, which leads Absolutely. me to this, right? That it seems to me, we talk about then what's at stake in our country. And I am reminded of the words of Martin Luther King Jr. He gave a speech, I think it was at Michigan State in the, in the early 60s. And Martin Luther King Jr. said that we aren't able, that with laws, we can't legislate the heart. He said, but at least we can make laws that stop folks from lynching. Well, mm -hmm. we see first of all, that the laws don't really stop that as we have our 21st century uh, examples of lynching that would be an Almond Audrey or a Breonna Taylor and the list could go on. But what it becomes even more frightening to me is that what's at stake for us, even as we talk about this reality of people making certain kinds of choices uh, uh, that negate the livelihood of someone else, is the heart and soul of our nation, the very humanity of our nation, regardless of the laws that people can allow this, the so-called good people can allow this to continue and to go on. Where's the moral leadership? From whence, Dr. Gloud, is that to come? Where's the faith communities? What's the role of faith communities in that? Oh my goodness, that's a great question, right? So we see that we see in some ways the barren land of white evangelicalism. Yeah. Right? I mean, <laughs> I, we want to be very clear. We see the Paula Whites and all of these folks surrounding Donald Trump and sanctifying and sacralizing in some ways uh, these policies. But what we do know is that there will be a cry from the land, right? that the true expression of God in the world will come from the most, the most vulnerable, the least of these, right? So it seems to me that in this moment, I'm not listening to religious leaders, I'm listening to what's going on on the ground, right? Because mm -hmm. there's an energy to really reimagine the country in the face of what is clearly, uh, how can I put this, the death rattle yeah. of a particular understanding of America. We have to begin to imagine ourselves in a different way. We're at this incredible crossroads to invoke a blues metaphor. And, and the crossroads is marked by, I think, something dying and something desperate to be born. We are all the midwives now. And the question is, you know, can we, can we give birth to this thing? There's just really quickly, um, Jamie, James Baldwin wrote a piece uh, about King the dangerous road before Martin Luther King. The dangerous road, that's right. And in that piece, he says, King is right that you know Jim Crow segregation is dead. 
And the question, he said, the question though is how long and how expensive will the funeral will be? <laughs> so we're still in that funeral march, that death march, trying to put this baby in the ground, trying to put this idea that America is a white nation in the ground. And so to answer your question very directly, I'm not looking to uh, uh, the religious leadership. I'm looking to the movement of God among everyday ordinary people and the voice of a vision of who we can be coming from those everyday ordinary people who are struggling to make manifest a different way of being in the world. And that will involve in part, I said this on national television, this might, this might make you tick, might tickle you. I said, what we need is to return to Revelations chapter two, verse five. And that is, we need to understand we got to do our first works over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got to tell a different yeah. story yeah. so that yeah. we can release ourselves into a different way of being in the world. That's yeah. what I think is necessary. Yeah, yeah. Well, well said. But what's so very interesting is for Christians, what you're saying is the heart of the matter. We're talking about a savior who was crucified, right? Mm. And the fact that Jesus was crucified indicates his utter, utter, utter solidarity with what I call the crucifying classes of people in the world. And Hello. which indicates that if we are going to understand justice at all, or that more just future that God promises, that the beginning of understanding that and of moving toward that future is with those who were on the most underside of injustice, That's who right. experience it as, 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 as uh, Howard Thurman would say, those with their backs up against the wall, and I like to say, or with no wall upon which to have their backs. Mm. That's from whence justice comes. And so you're right. So you've kind of indicted, Dr. Glau, the, the church, because you were suggesting that the church is more a social institution than it is to be church and that if our democracy is aspirational, so is our claims for the faith community that we are church. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. So, and you know, that's not to say that they're not in, in individual prophetic voices out there, but if, where, we, where we look, where, mm -hmm. we lis where we listen, feeds right into what you just said. So again, ditto, ditto, ditto. <laughs> <laughs> so, so 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 let me let me take you to another place real quick as we're we're coming up on our time. Here we are in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. And if that's not bad enough, we are navigating this pandemic with a vision to make America great again. What is your greatest fear as we approach the November elections with the Make America Great Again vision and COVID? You know, history teaches us, American history teaches us that whenever white folk get scared, <laughs> they get real dangerous. Yep. And that's just a historical fact. Right. Whenever it feels like the society is fundamentally changing, that the structures that once organized our relations with one another are deteriorating and a new way of being is trying to emerge, it's always marked by extraordinary violence. Right? Yes. You think about what happened in the context of the nadir as Jim Crow was beginning to crumble. Right. You think about what what was what was happening in the context of reconstruction? You think about what was happening in the context of um, uh, not not the nadir, but the context of the of the black freedom struggle and how Jim Crow was collapsing and and the violence that came out of it. So part of what I'm suggesting here is that my biggest fear is that these folk will feel that the demographic shifts and the economic decline represents that they've lost complete control over the country and that they rather throw the whole damn thing in the garbage can before they let it go, before they let it go. And what will attend that, you see? And so I fear that, I know Donald Trump is gonna do, two, I call it the three C's. 
He's going to carpet bomb Biden. He's going to stoke the culture wars and he's going to cheat. That's what that's what Trump's going to do. And so if he wins in November, we might as well put the last nail in the coffin on the American project. And then we are going to have to be very, very, very much concerned about the well-being of the folks that we love. That's my biggest fear, that the country will double down on its hatred in the face of this possibility to be otherwise. Yes, I could not agree with you more that I think that we are entering into a more dangerous and volatile time the closer that we get to the election because a certain uh, culture will hang on as tightly as it can at at all costs. Mm -hmm. So here's what we know, that even as we talk about the church and these times that we're getting ready to face and perhaps the inadequacy of our faith communities, that any time there's been real change and transformation for the better in this country, as it tries to live into its higher angels or its greatest aspirations, Mm -hmm. the faith community has been involved, has been a part of that movement. Mm -hmm. And so as this is an opportunity, you're right. We're at, a, we're at a decision point about the not only the shape of our nation politically and socially, but about the heart and the soul. Who are we going to be as a people? This election is so important in this regard. What, what, what's the role? What do you see the role? What role should those who claim to be church play? You know, I, I wouldn't be as so arrogant to, to answer that question with any degree of certainty, but I know what's in my gut. So I wanna hear right. your gut. <laughs> One of the more insidious, and I've been saying this across the country regularly, but I mean it from the bottom of my heart. One of the more insidious features of our current moment is the all out assault on our imaginations. Mm. We can't imagine ourselves differently. You know, Jimmy says, Baldwin says, he wants us to do something unprecedented to create a self without the need for enemies. Isn't that Mm. beautiful? (laughs) And so this idea of what the faith community must do is it's a prophetic act in some ways. It is to put forward a vision of who we can be in light of how fallen we currently are, right? And that, that's often dealt in the minor key. Mm-hmm. Right? We often tend to misread the church as if it's by definition prophetic, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> the prophetic voice has always been in the minor key, right? And so what part of what has to happen is that we have to hit that chord, right? We have to play it, right, right, with a certain kind of, 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 of forcefulness, to give it that blues intonation, right? Because the imagination is the key to release us into a different future. You know, Emerson says, God speaks to us through our imaginations. Whenever I use that quote with my students, I said, if that's true, then what is the devil doing? <laughs> right, right, right. So part of, part of what I think the faith community has to do is, to, is not to point, you know, beyond right, our material world, but the point beyond this particular iteration of the world. No. And then to give voice to a notion of justice and love so that we can be together differently. And let me say this really quickly, because I know we're running out of time. So many people are losing their loved ones. I, I remember I was talking with a friend of mine and he lost his dad. And they're from New Orleans and they can't do the second line. Mm. <laughs> or we lo- talking to friends and, and they can't sit shiver. That's right. Or you can't hold the, the wake. We can't grieve properly. And so this, and we can't even be together. So we got to figure out how to do this again on the other side of this. So the kind of persons that we are while we're going through COVID and who we will be co- post COVID will depend on how we imagine our way through this collective unimaginable grief, 
right? And it seems to me that faith leaders, the faith community must do that work now at a level that we've never seen before. What a perfect place and so many ways to put a pin in this conversation that I hope you and I will continue at another time. And what you call that has been the minor key, you're so right, in faith communities should truly be the major key because mm. by definition, we are the only communities that but our very identity holds us accountable not to this world, but accountable to a more just future. And so you leave us with the challenge to unleash our imagination that is the imagination of God's more just mm -hmm. future. Yeah, amen. Dr. Eddie Glau, thank you for your wisdom, for your work, for your insights. And I want to encourage again, everybody, I think your book is to be released the 1st of August. Begin again, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own. Thank you. Thank you. You take care. Take care.